Then over here, there's Carl Soil Building. We're recycling nutrients in our carbon and nitrogen system by cutting the living mulch. And that looks like about two tons, maybe more, two to three tons per acre of hay being added to the system. And yet, sometimes we have to balance towards the economic side. And here, we are mowing all but about 30% of the habitat because we are making areas for the cold air to drain so that we can protect tender little developing fruits from frosty nights. So you can see the balancing act within this wood leaf web and the web of nature. Lots to go on. And one of the things that we're still learning about is birds within Woodleaf's web. We know that these flycatchers on the right and these black-eyed juncos come in flocks at certain time, and they spend a lot of time in the orchard. And we know that black-eyed juncos particularly, half of their summer diet is insects. So we think that these guys are a really important part of our ecosystem and are reconnecting back to the web of nature. And so this is a big problem that I need your help with. Recent fears of the new food safety regulations may cut some of the threads in nature's web. As it turns out, farmers in California are already so concerned that in a 2007 survey from Monterey County, it turns out that 40% of farmers have removed wildlife from their fields on the recommendation of food safety auditors. 30% have eliminated non-crop vegetation from their farms. Do you know what that means? That means habitat building. They've removed all the habitat building that I've just been talking to you about. And 7% have bulldozed in ponds. So. There's some balancing to get us back into nature's web that I need your help with. Carl and I, law, all of us farmers, need the help of eaters everywhere to say, wow, you know, we, we want food to be safe, but we need more research and we want to make sure that we're not getting rid of one thing because we have fears for food safety. So I hope that if any of you are surveyed or have a chance to, uh, to comment, that you'll, uh, you'll remember how important habitat building is. So in the end, what we're really doing at Woodleaf is instead of just managing specific crops, we're really monitoring and managing relationships in the entire web at our farm and the entire web of nature. And how far can we take our farm back into the web? And I mean the web of nature there, of course. So Carl, uh, in his ultimate patience, has given me a half acre to play with, and we're trying to develop the Woodleaf Forest Farm. And it's not quite ready for prime time yet, but we're getting some wonderful results. So what we're trying to do is continue to leave that perennial living mulch lots of biodiversity cover, but we're also growing annual vegetables, like that cabbage, and mixing it in with strawberries and artichokes, and we're eating very well. So that's another story. Maybe in a year we'll be able to tell you that this is a productive system for us as well. So to finish, I want to say that it's so, been so important to us to put ourselves back in the web, not just for the biological reasons, but because as we reattach ourselves to the web of nature, we realize that we're growing a diet. And we're eating a sunshine-powered, phytonutrient, plant-rich diet, and we feel healthier. And so to finish, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we try to disconnect farm health, human health, and nature. And reconnecting them not only brings us a biological system like we've described today, but also is bringing us better health. And 
making us nicer, as my family in the front row will attest. <laughs> so thank you for listening. And I also want to thank the uh, funding agencies who have helped us do all of this nerdy research that uh, we've reported on, that help us understand our system. And that's the uh, USDA Western Sustainable Ag Research and Education uh, Organization, Fruit Guys Community Fund, Rodale Your Two Cents Program, and the Organic Farming Research Foundation. So thank you for that, and we hope that other farmers and that you, young minds, will go out and help answer some of the questions that we don't have the answers to yet. So we're ready for questions. I hope you have some. Oh boy. Do. Oh, you're going to do it. Um, how, does, how does water use uh, differ in between using perennial mulch and a non-cover crop farm? So, you're, so she's asking how, what's the difference between cover cropping and living mulch in terms of, in terms of water use? Water use. Yeah. Do we both want to address this? No, go ahead. It's so in my farm in Montana, I experimented with drought tolerant living mulches and I didn't have as much success, but I, like Carl, I had a good source of gravity flow water, so I, I, I was never forced to do it. We know that by having uh, soil covered and by having organic residues added uh, like a mulch, that we're able to increase soil organic matter and increase water, water holding capacity. We know that when we till soil, which you do for a cover crop, you, you till a cover crop in, that's the difference between a living mulch and a, and a cover crop. It, it ultimately is incorporated into the soil. We know that every time we incorporate into the soil that we degrade a little bit of soil organic matter. So. Uh, I think it depends on the soil type and it depends on the crop you're growing. I think that we could get away with irrigating a little bit less because the soil organic matter has increased. And at my farm, I started working on that, but I, I, I didn't get far enough with it to be able to give you any quantitative assessment of, of, of which would be different. I will tell you uh, that in Montana, some of the scientists that I work with in wheat production looked at tilling and leaving a winter fallow. We left it fallow in the winter so that we could collect snow and rain and the idea was that that would increase the water in the soil because it's, we're talking about areas that we're getting about 11 inches of, of precip every year. And what they found was that actually uh, a, a system that added organic residues and didn't till was over time, as soil organic matter levels built up, holding more water than the, the uh, winter fallow. So that doesn't quite answer your question, but I think, I think your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to write a grant and study that. Do you want to address that at all? Um, I don't, I, I would rather not use less water because what I'm going for is, is that, is the, keeping the organisms happy. So don't overwater, don't underwater, just give, you know, what you think is the right amount. It's nice to have enough water to be able to do that. If I had to farm a different way with the soils that we have, it would be difficult to farm with, you know, half the amount of water and get anywhere close to the same production. If we had to, you know, we could figure out systems that would still give us production, but it's nice, it's nice to have abundant water, and, and we do, so we use it. Good question, though, an, an important question in these times. Yeah, we have a question from one of our uh, viewers. Um, were either of you influenced by the macrobiotic uh, writers who were writing about 50, 40, 50 years ago, and I guess more broadly, who were your influences? Um, well, Helen's got some great ones because she went out and, and searched for who those people were. I, you know, kind of followed Rodale and how they said compost, 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 which ultimately was kind of not the right track. 
but I mean, it was on the right track, but the, but it didn't really pull in the you know how the minerals work together, which you know I found to me was a very important piece. Um, you know, we I sold to the macrobiotic community, and Oroville had a center that they had people come. But uh, Herman and I can't remember; they were some famous people, but I can't remember who they were. But Helen can talk to a few people that she studied under that were the you know the pioneers of of ways to do things, Fukuoka especially. Y yeah, when I was um, as young as some of you in this room, in my uh, early twenties, I was lucky enough to. Um, uh, study uh, briefly with Masanobu Fukuoka and I worked in uh, northeast Georgia with um, with uh, folks who had worked with Masanobu Fukuoka and that was eye-opening. Another important uh, opening of my mind to ecology uh, was uh, spending a year at the Land Institute in, in Salina, Kansas and um, being forced by Wes Jackson to read um, Plant Population Biology and Ecology, uh, which forever changed the way I look at agriculture. I hope I'm not forgetting somebody important. Um, I probably am, but that's what happens when you get to be our age. Did that answer the question? Oh, macrobiotics. Um, uh, brief flirtation with macrobiotics in my mid-20s. <laughs> So, 